Welcome to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. My name is Kimberly Jackson. I'm the Executive Director. I'm so proud to be at our Clearwater campus at St. P. College today, where we have a full audience that I hope you get to see, full of students and young minds eager to learn about economics and the state of economics in Florida. I'd like to thank St. Petersburg Clearwater for hosting us. Most importantly, the St. Petersburg Chamber of Commerce and Amplify Clearwater for partnering with us. I say the same spiel every time, so I'm going to continue with that theme. The Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, or like we, as we like to call it, ISPS, is a gathering spot. It's a place where all minds can learn about civic discourse. They can understand the importance of how their government acts, and they can learn and enhance their educational experience. Congressman Young led this dream um, about a little over 10 years ago with the idea that all students in rising leaders should understand the appropriate scope of government and understand how to engage in our community. With that, I'm going to turn it over very quickly. We have an exciting panel on economic development with professionals who will be discussing the state of the economic development around the state. It will be moderated by Christine Bruner, the Vice President of Advocacy for the St. Petersburg Chamber of Commerce. And so thank you for doing that. And our panelists, as she makes her way to the podium, our podium are Joe Lugo, the Chief of Staff of Amplify uh, Clearwater, um, Suzanne Chrisman, the Pinellas County Economic Development of Pinellas County Economic Development, Mike Bishop, the Vice President of the Pasco EDC, um, Jamal um, Sowell, the former Secretary of Commerce for the State of Florida, and currently with Indelible, the corporation, and Steve um, Cover, the Director of Planning for the City of St. Petersburg of Sarasota. I hope that I did not butcher your names. I try really hard not to do that in the beginning. Um, thank you for your time. Please ask as many questions as you can. That's what they're here for with that. Christine, take it away. Thank you. Good morning, good morning. As Kimberly said, my name is Christy Bruner. I'm the Vice President of Advocacy at the St. Petersburg Area Chamber of Commerce. And thank you to St. Pete College ISPS program for hosting this important conversation today. Please feel free to write those notes and uh, questions and get those to us for after our, our discussion today. So in my role with the St. Petersburg Chamber, our goal is to engage chamber members um, with topics that are important to the business community and economic growth of our city. And and one of the ways that we do that is through our Future of Work Task Force, which really focuses on the intersectionality of the private sector, business community, and the education ecosystem. So I think you'll hear some tones of that throughout our discussion today with these um, panelists from all different uh, genres today. So to get kicked off, I would love to have each of our panelists share one impactful project, investment, or development that your team has been working on to give, to give us a taste of what your department is doing right now. And we'll start down the end at Mike. All right, great. Well, um, hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Mike Bishop. I'm the Senior Vice President of the Pasco Economic Development Council. So I'm from the uh, county from the great white north of uh, Tampa Bay here. Um, impactful project. So um, one of the most impactful projects our county is undergoing right now is an 800-acre project called Spiros, Florida, which is um, from Moffitt Campus or uh, Moffitt Cancer Center. So they're building an 800-acre medical city, essentially. It's a 20-year project. Um, the blueprint is larger than the, the land print of uh, the city of Tampa, believe it or not. Um, so this is a huge undertaking for our county. Um, you know, we don't have St. Pete or Tampa in our county, so 800-acre project, very big deal. Um, forecast is uh, close to 15,000 jobs over the 20-year the span. So massive infrastructure, new roads going in, um, and explosive growth, which I'm sure I'll talk about more later. So, yeah. Thank you. We'll go over to Suzanne. Impactful project or program we have going on. Hey, thanks. So I'm with Pinellas County Economic Development, which is where you are right now. You probably, most of you probably know that. Um, one thing I do want to mention, um, as Mike talks about this great project going on just north of us, um, it affects all of us, regardless of um, what county or specific territory we're representing. <laughs> um, we have a very regional workforce, um, so we work together a lot. Our, our wins, we share the wins. Um, and I think one of the you know, most impactful projects that we've um, recently completed and continue to work on is the Jabel expansion. Um, if you've driven down Roosevelt Boulevard and you've seen that redevelopment project, the old headquarters building that was knocked down and it's a brand new, beautiful campus um, which is expanding 
added many, many, many more jobs, high wage jobs, and it, they continue to expand. We work with them, I think I, I am on the phone with them at least once a week. So I think for us, that's one of our most recent impactful projects. Thank you so much. And I'll echo the importance of the regional connectivity and regional communication between projects because we have people that are living in Tampa and working in St. Pete and living in Pasco and working in Clearwater that everything needs to work together. So that's why I appreciate the diversity <laughs> of this panel. <laughs> I hit the nail on the head. All right, we'll move down to Steve. Uh, what, what can you tell us about what's going on in Sarasota? Yeah, yeah, in Sarasota, of course, we're, uh, we're really known for our cultural tourism. Um, and uh, one project that's brand new, uh, when I started in Sarasota uh, seven years ago, um, actually during my interview, I was given a driving tour of the city, and I drove by this one site. It's a 53-acre city-owned parcel right on the bay. <laughs> Um, and uh, it was basically a giant parking lot, a 50-year-old performance, uh, performance hall, uh, a bunch of older buildings, half of them um, empty, and a lot of homeless people hanging out there, actually. So, so anyway, um, we decided, I said, um, I said I was, as I was walking around the site, I said, does the city have any plans for this? Because it's actually a spectacular site. They said, oh yeah, we just put together a group to take a look at this. And the performance hall, the, the loading dock faces the bay. So I said, this is absolutely the most beautiful loading dock in the entire country. <laughs> um, but anyway, we started working on it. We developed a master plan. It was approved by our commission. Uh, the first phase is already completed. It's this beautiful park on the south side. The older, the older buildings are going to be converted to music venues, uh, the arts center. Uh, we're building a brand new performing arts center. It's going to be designed by Renzo Piano, one of the greatest, uh, really, theater architects in the world. Uh, they're going to be designing it. And um, when this is all said and done, there will be some restaurants, an outdoor amphitheater that looks out over the bay, uh, obviously, the, the new performing arts center, like I said previously. So parking lots to this, you know, this is going to be transform transformational for, for Sarasota. Absolutely, that sounds like it. And I think we should all take a trip over the bridge. It's not that far. Um, it's super amazing. Um, and Joe, tell us about what you're doing in uh, Clearwater right now. Sure. I'm Joe Lugo. I'm Chief of Staff of Amplify Clearwater. We're a chamber plus, and the reason I say plus is because we're a lot more than just a chamber. So there's a lot of things that we're working on in the area. I'm a big believer in this area. I love this area. I live in this area, and I care about what happens in this area. So I'm going to sum it up by one of our projects that we're working on. And you may have heard about the tourism incubator. It's the only tourism incubator that we have in the state. Uh, it focuses on companies that are working in what is our bread and butter, the backbone of our industry, or the backbone of our economy here in Clearwater, which is tourism. And so we have a program that is 10 weeks long. We help businesses scale, skill up, get better at what they do, and stay here and become productive in this area. We also uh, are going to be launching our Entrepreneur Center. This is exciting and it should be very interested, interesting to you because one of the things that we would love to do is to see how we can connect the local talent pool, you guys, with the local companies that are here. We want to be able to create a workforce development program where it's seamless, where we can go from, from middle school, high school, college, and right into the workforce here locally, as opposed to having to go somewhere else. I believe that this area is the most beautiful area in the world. You may have been to a lot of places, I have, but I love it here and I'd like to see the best talent stay here. I'd like to see the best companies stay here, and I'd like to be able to draw some of those companies here. So uh, as a step one, we're focusing on tourism, we're focusing on workforce development, we're focusing on boot camps and training programs and skilling up programs to help our local community, our local businesses, and the community grow and, and continue to attain their dreams and so on and so forth. So I look forward to meeting with you at some point. I look forward to you being in our program in some way, shape or form. And I look forward to seeing the future CEOs and directors and managers of our area. Whew, that was impactful right there. So hopefully you guys are all interested to learn a little bit more about what the Clearwater, Amplify Clearwater programs have going on. Now, Jamal, you are transitioned from the uh, public sector to private sector in a new organization now. Can you tell us a little bit more what you have going on there? Everybody, so I'm a 
I'm a Florida native, um, sixth six generation Floridian. My parents are from the backwoods of Florida, and I'll tell you why that's important. So first, um, I'll tell you what is economic development and how that applies to you. People say the term economic development, but they never really describe it. At a basic level, essentially it's uh, job creation, there's tax packages that go with that. But at a, at a simple level, essentially um, the idea of business being created in a city or a county for jobs. And for how that applies to you, when you graduate from these great schools such as St. Pete College, people here want to make sure that we can keep the talent, that there's corporations. So raise your hand if you were born in Florida. So about half the room. A lot of people will come to Florida because of the jobs or because of the weather. We want to make sure that you have the opportunity to stay here, to keep that talent here, versus going to New York, going to Chicago, going to Charlotte. And that's what economic development is, is to really retain talent, but also to improve areas. And eventually I'll talk about how that has changed, the topic of economic development has changed, and eventually I'll talk about how that intersects into politics. But overall, now that I'm in the private sector, uh, after serving in government, I have a lot of flexibility to really say um, how this will impact your life, not only now, but for the future, and with indelible we do a state contracting for local and county governments and state level two for hurricane recovery, IT implementation, healthcare, internal audits. So it's exciting to now be in the private side, but also having the knowledge from the public sector really allows me how, uh, taught me how to navigate because when you're in the public sector, you have to learn how to deal with officials. You have to learn how to really um, navigate each city and municipality on its own because every part of the state of Florida is different, and they'll tell you that um, in a few. Absolutely. Thank you so much for setting the stage, too, with that kind of just basic definition and where are we starting from and why do these professionals have so much stake in helping you guys att attain your goals and reach the goals for a future of our community. Amazing. Okay, we're going to start off again down with um, Mike um, talking about something that's a little bit specific to him. Um, and Mike came from um, founding Big Storm Brewery um, and started in the private sector and is kind of going over and working more on an economic uh, level at the um, uh, county level now. Uh, so I'd love to know about what challenges or opportunities does the Tampa Bay region, again, we're talking about the whole region, right? We're not isolated, um, in terms of economic diversification. What steps are needed to address them? Yeah, so uh, great question. And like Suzanne said, it is a very regional play here. We all work very closely together, share workforce. You're hearing a lot of themes from the panel that I'm going to keep repeating as well, which I'm sure you're going to hear throughout. Uh, workforce is a significant challenge. I mean, we're we're experiencing a skills gap right now where um, what we have currently in our region isn't matching where the region is going. Um, diversification is a big topic for us. Our mission of the EDC is actually to promote balanced and diversified business growth for Pasco County. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Florida has the same situation. You know, we're very reliant on tourism. We have a booming tourism industry. Um, we're relying on health care, retail, but these are also industries that are susceptible to uh, pandemics that happen sometimes now um, and other financial downturns. Um, so we need to be able to, like Jamal said, have other good high paying jobs available for our, our future workforce. Um, one of the ways we do that is, you know, in economic development, we're working to recruit businesses and help businesses in our area. Um, we have target industries that we go after, which matches the state, and a lot of us along the state have, have similar industries. Uh, one of those is advanced manufacturing. Um, these are good future high paying jobs. People um, need to break down the stigma of manufacturing. The future of Florida in manufacturing is very bright, as Suzanne will talk about here in Pinellas. It's a hotbed for it. Um, but it's not the smokestacks and the factories of the past. I mean, these are uh, jobs in robotics and, and um, engineering and, and, um, and software engineering. They're just fantastic jobs. Um, life sciences is also a big focus for us as well, um, especially in Pasco with the Spiros project that's happening. Um, you know, we don't have all the, the researchers and the lab scientists that we need for that campus. So 
um, it's a significant challenge for us. Now, good news is on the opportunity side, Jamal kind of stole my thunder here. You asked how many people are from Florida. I was gonna ask the opposite. So through process <laughs> of elimination, I kind of watched, there's a good group of you that are not from Florida. Well, our region is so, ben it's, it, we get the benefit of so much migration from other regions. We have a beautiful region, like Joe said. We should be very proud of it. Um, and we get the talent that's coming in. We just need to make sure we're getting the right talent that's coming in and continue to develop our talent here. We work very closely in PASCO with our education institutions. Um, we have PHSC, PASCO Hernando State College as part of the system. Um, and we work with them and connecting them to employers to identify what, what does the workforce have to look like five, 10 years, 15 years from now. Um, because there, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that we're facing right now. Uh, tradesmen is an issue as well. Um, you know, we're trying to get welders and electricians. Uh, you know, electrician might not be as sexy as getting on YouTube, but you know what? Hey, start a YouTube channel about being an electrician. I'm <laughs> sure you're gonna do fantastic with it. So um, as many challenges we face, there is a bright future here for Tampa Bay. Wonderful, thank you. thank you. And if any other panelists have uh, any ideas to pop in about these questions, please feel free to do so. Raise your hand and let me know. Um, and that makes sense. Thank you for bringing that up, Mike, uh, that trying to connect the job uh, seekers with the job that exists, right? There are a lot of uh, really qualified um, job seekers and a lot of amazing jobs that we've been, that been created and we wanna make sure connecting those and creating that sense of community. Moving on to Suzanne, um, tell us about, um, I know your background with the Florida Economic Development Council, so you have a great um, uh, idea of what's going on around the state um, from the economic development perspective. So what initiatives, uh, initiatives or policies has the state of Florida implemented to attract businesses and foster economic growth and how can more communities and regions take advantage of these policies uh, to implement it, these initiatives so this is a great question and it's a very timely question <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, as Christy mentioned I'm I was been very involved with the Florida Economic Development Council. And what that is, it's an association of economic development organizations across the state. So we belong to this um, association. We come together. Um, we, we take on state challenges. And I'm the immediate past chair, so I've been very involved in a lot of the initiatives um, and challenges that have been going on um, at our state level for the last uh, year, year and a half. So. At the state level, and you're going to learn there's many levels of economic development, right? Um, so at the state level, we've had an organization called Enterprise Florida uh, for a long time. And it was a public-private organization. Uh, recently, the last year or so, the legislature decided um, that that organization was going to be dissolved and that economic development would fall back under the Department of Commerce. So we now have an organization at the state level for economic development called Florida Commerce with a, a similar organization underneath it called Select Florida. It's very confusing um, <laughs> right now, and, <laughs> and it's not just confusing to us, it's confusing out in the marketplace um, on a national level. So that is a challenge right now. There's a transition going on. You know, there, there's a whole new structure, um, organizational structure, finance structure that has to take place, and, and transitioning organizations in this manner doesn't happen overnight. So it's gonna take time. I tell people that it's gonna be fine. It'll be good. Um, for me, you know, I, I see that there is an opportunity and I speak with my peers at Florida Commerce frequently um, and, and give input and guidance. I've been doing economic development in this state for almost 24 years now. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly and I have ideas and I'm always happy to share them. Um, so I do speak regularly with them and I feel that there's opportunity because they, at this point, it's kind of like a blank slate. Like we can refresh, we can do things different now. Um, we can start over, right? We've got, we've got the capacity right now with this new organization to really look at things and see how should we be doing things in 2024. It's very different than how we were doing things in 2000, who it should be very different, right? Um, so I do see an opportunity. I also see that over the last year or so, the local level, economic developers, you know, a lot of us sitting here, we've really had to step up our game to fill some gaps um, during this transition. And not only us, but also our utility partners. Um, you know, this might be eye-opening to you as well, but Duke Energy, Florida Power and Light, Tico, they have economic development staff. Um, and they've all done a great job stepping up and kind of filling the gap of some of those services um, that are taking some time to transition. 
Um, so it's really, it's made us up our game. And I will tell you, um, you know, just prior to that decision being made a, a few years earlier, um, we lost our job creation incentive. So that was a tax credit for businesses creating new jobs. And, and that just kind of puts us at a competitive disadvantage with some other states. In between that and then this change of structure with our statewide economic development agency, these other states are taking advantage of it. Let's just put it that way. There's a lot of um, you know, press that they're putting out there saying, hey, Florida doesn't want economic development. Florida doesn't want business anymore, um, which is all completely false. But it's a competitive industry, right? So they're going to they're gonna jump on stuff like that. So for us, we really have to step up and get the word out that, no, we are open for business. We are a business-friendly state, a uh, very pro-business state. And when you compare tax structures overall, we are still um, extremely competitive and can still win those projects. But it's just, you know, there's a lot of bad press out there, I guess is the way to put it. Um, so we're working through that. And like I said, I, I tell people, a lot of people call me and ask, like, what's going on? Or, you know, what are we going to do? And I said, it'll be fine. I just give it time. You know, transition takes time. Um, and, and we'll get through it. And, and together as a state, like I said, we've really pulled together. And even FEDC, um, you know, we all came together quickly and started filling the gap for some of those services that were kind of falling wayside during this transition time. So I feel like we've got a good... Um, kind of strong network in place that we can still, we can step up and support the state until the state is ready to uh, be able to kind of run the charge uh, forward again on its own and with us as partners. Right, Jamal, did you want to add something? So this is a larger theme for those who are here 18, 19 years old. So I'm 41, so I'm the old guy here. <laughs> and um, so, so I became a, a Republican in college and the political landscape has changed so much. So 20 years ago, in college, if a Republican questioned wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were a rhino, they were a liberal, they really weren't a Republican. Now it's totally shifted that people can actually ask the questions and everything has changed. And even with economic development, 20 years ago, um, that was a major topic for Republicans. Now, things have kind of shifted, and people are now saying, oh, maybe not give to corporations, maybe not uh, for tax incentives. And it's interesting how it's changed so much that uh, for those students here today, I just say stay consistent in your views as you start to have your own philosophy, have your own views. Because one day when it shifts, it could now be popular or things change um, for your benefit. So I think that there has been a major shift with economic development, with party ideologies, and, and just with every, everything in the world. So um, I think a part of that is just the shift that is now different for various reasons. But I think now it's um, the political lines have been blurred. And every 20 years or every 30 years, there could be a shift for whatever reasons. So just make sure that you ask the questions and also you get to know uh, the issues that, that you're passionate about. That's a great point. Um, economic development is a constantly changing industry. Um, you know, every day is completely different. It's these, all these outside forces are what tell us what we're gonna be doing today. Um, you have no control over it. There could be a recession, there could be a pandemic. There, you know, I mean, and your job changes um, overnight. A hurricane, you know, we all go into emergency management mode. I mean, so the, it's constantly changing. No two days are the same. Um, so if you're a person who doesn't like change, it's definitely not the industry for you. <laughs> but um, to that point, over the, yeah, just the 20-some years I've been here, there's been so much change. And typically the people, you know, like my team and probably a lot of the economic developers around the state, we thrive on that. We like change. We like um, new challenges. That's why we're in this industry. Absolutely. And that is a great generational comment, especially for this audience here. And what I heard Suzanne say is that there's opportunities for this next generation to put their input and their impact into these changes that are being made at the state level. That's not just for the people that have been in the industry for 10 years and 20 years and 30 years. They're looking for new voices and new ideas. So that's your opportunity. 
All right, moving on to Steve, um, talking about the cultural amenities that he spoke about in the Bay down in Sarasota Project. And I've been there, it's amazing. My brother lives in Sarasota, so I've been able to visit there. Coming from St. Petersburg, we have our, our St. Petersburg waterfront and our, our, our public arts programming. So tell us about um, how do quality of life programs and projects and cultural amenities help to retain and recruit businesses and how and ensure economic growth? And do you believe it's important for the business community to get more involved with prioritizing the arts? Yeah, that's a good question. And <clears throat> I think economic development, uh, particularly in Sarasota, has really changed. It's, it's not your basic try to draw in major corporations, that kind of thing. Um, one, of the thing one of the first things I heard when, um, when I got to Sarasota was that high school students, when they graduated, they said, um, uh, they told their parents, I'm going to college and I'm never coming back. Well, that has changed in Sarasota. Uh, they are coming back. Um, and one of the things is that there's, a, there's, an, there's really a, an attraction <clears throat> and, and really a, a very different vibe in Sarasota. We're, we're, we're very much focused on placemaking and making it a cool city. And so uh, the Brookings Institute came out with a, with a survey of the top 10 cities in the country for millennials to locate to. And, the, and, and in the top 10 were your typical Denver, Austin, Portland. And they're in, the, they're in the number nine spot was Sarasota, Florida, which really was quite interesting. And so we, uh, we realized that, um, you know, okay, we've got something going here and we're attracting really startup companies, small companies, startup companies. They're, they're moving into Sarasota. And, and the joke I always say is, well, Sarasota, we have, the average age in Sarasota is 46. And so we have a lot of old people, and we have a lot of new young people, but nobody is actually 46 years old in Sarasota. <laughs> and actually in one group, one lady in the back said, hey, I'm 46. But, but anyway, so the cultural arts uh, really is a major draw. Uh, we have a very unusual city. Obviously we have great beaches and a lot of communities do. But we're also the, the home of the Ringling Circus. We also have a really big Amish Mennonite population. And we have tremendous arts, which really draw people. And, and if you focus on cool things to do in your city, which is what we've been doing, that has made a huge difference. We have events taking place all the time, all over the city. And just to give you an idea, just related to the arts, performing arts and cultural resources, we probably have about five to 6,000 jobs that are just focused on that in the city. Uh, we generate probably about $68, $68 million in tax revenues just from the, that part of the city's um, uh, economy. And, and so and, and what that translates to is about $46 per person who's coming to the city to go to a show or go to a special event. Uh, it, uh, the average, it's per person, $46 per person. So if you, if you have one event that draws 1,000 people, <laughs> you're bringing in almost $50,000 of spending into your city. And so we've really been focusing on that and it's, it's made a huge difference and that's one of the reasons why I think we're, we're attracting so many new young people to the city is that it's a cool place to be and there's a lot to do. Absolutely. Another cool place to be and is focused on placemaking is Clearwater. Lots of beaches up there for sure. And um, Joe already talked a little bit about his um, tourism incubator that um, just started uh, at Amplify Clearwater. So what ways, Joe, do you see that the tourism sector has influenced the economic development in Florida? And how do you see tourism and hospitality contributing to the future health of our economy? Absolutely. So I, I'm a transplant. I'm not originally from Florida, although one of my sons is born here. Uh, and so we moved from New York City, and it took me two years to figure out how Florida works or that I even wanted to be here. Uh, 26 years ago, Florida was very different than the Florida you know right now. And so I, I've watched Florida grow, places like St. Pete, places like even <coughs> the beach area, even Sarasota, or if you go to North County, it, does, it did not look how it looks now. So I know that it's healthy and that there's development going on. I can tell you that when I moved down here, uh, I noticed one thing. Everybody in my family wanted to come visit me. Not because they <laughs> miss me, 
but because this was a cool spot to come. We've got the best beaches, we've got, if and back then I had doubts, but now I think we have some of the best restaurants, we have some of the best activities, we have some of the best places for concerts, and to watch a show, and to do many, many different things, and if you're an outdoors person, gosh, this is like heaven, right? So I've watched all of this grow, and I've said to myself, okay, this is amazing. The backbone of our area really is tourism. That's what's drawing people here. So I came here many, many years ago, twice. First time was to Disney, and I said I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> and the second time was to Clearwater. And this is when I said, hmm, this has possibilities. Now granted, I got rid of my New York state of mind. I've traded it for my Clearwater state of mind. Much better, better for my heart, better for my blood pressure. But I will tell you that I see tourism is what's attracting people. So we just recently did a, a partnership uh, with the city and we brought in, we did like an incubator with some tech companies from outside of the United States. And the, the reoccurring theme that I kept getting was, hey, this is a great place for vacation. Vacation. I would love to bring my family. There's so many things to do. The weather is amazing. Uh, is this your winter, really? Because this is not winter. I mean, a lot of things like that. So what I asked is, what would it take for you to come and move your business here? What would it take for you to come and and put a headquarters or an office here in this area? And and really, the answer was not a whole lot. Everything is here. Mm -hmm. I just need business. And so one of the things that I have made a purpose of mine personally is to help businesses connect, is to help them connect, is to see Clearwater, to see our area, to see Florida as more than just a vacation place. You could actually live where everybody else comes for vacation. The tourism industry has many, many opportunities and many openings. And it's an, it's an area that's usually not considered as much these days as, as other industries, right? Like everybody wants to become a, a programmer or a doctor or, or a, an accountant. And all of these things are very important here if you look around because it's part of the tourism industry. Everything is connected to the tourism industry. So our purpose at, at Amplify is to really help the industry grow. Those businesses that are starting up in tourism, that want to be in tourism, that are connected to tourism, and that want to grow economically to connect them on that ecosystem that we have going on here. So I see it as a very viable piece. And I also see it as a piece that's gonna lead to other pieces. I see this area becoming a tech area. I mean, if you look around the Tampa Bay area, we're starting to get younger <laughs> tech startups. I see this as a, a fashion area. We're starting to get companies that are coming down that are dabbling in fashion. One of the companies that I, I had an opportunity to talk to, they're from uh, Venezuela. She does um, apparel for women. It's sports apparel. It's smart apparel, it's computerized apparel, I don't get it, but it can, it can I'm not that smart, but it, it, it can check your temperature, it can tell you where your heart rate is, it can do all kinds of things. I, I wonder if they have some that for men, because I, I probably could use a t-shirt like that, but um, so, so there are things happening, there's an attraction, there's a, there's, you, are, you are living in this area, from, as far as I'm concerned, in one of the most exciting times where things are happening, things are changing, things are shifting, and things are just getting ready to explode. This is how I see it, and I'm gonna be here. I may not see the full explosion, but I am gonna light that fire as best as I can. And I think that as leaders, as people who are living here, who are leading this charge, we have to make sure that we understand the, the viability, the importance of what tourism does for us and the connection that it has to so many areas and so many other things in our, in our industry and in our community, right? And so I just wanna let you know that you are in, in a place where this is just about to take off. And if you hang out, you can ride this wave. And you're gonna be very happy here. You're gonna be very happy with what's happening, with what's going on. But again, it takes patience. Things don't happen overnight. You don't just show up on your freshman year and they give you a diploma. You gotta go through the course, right? You gotta go through the process. So there's a process happening and it's very exciting. Absolutely, yep. Go ahead, Suzanne. I'll add again. Um, you know, I think a lot of, times people don't realize how connected economic development and tourism is. Um, you know, great points, and I can't tell you how many times uh, we're working with a project, a CEO wants to bring his company here, he goes, well, I, I came to Clearwater Beach and I loved it, and I thought, gosh, why not just 
be here full time. Um, so we actually started tracking that because it was happening, you know, we were hearing it anecdotally pretty frequently and then we partner with our visit St. Pete Clearwater um, a lot now too. We're working very closely with them and, and they started asking us that question. I said, yeah, I know it happens, but we, we don't have numbers to that. So we started tracking that now. That's one of the questions we ask businesses. You know, why did you decide to come here? Or why did you start your business here? Um, and that way we can better feed our tourism folks that data that they need. And we really do ride the coattails a little bit um, of the tourism piece because something to think about is, you know, that those organizations, I know up in Pasco too, so they get bed tax dollars, right? So they've got pretty hefty budgets and they do a ton of marketing. They're spending millions and millions of dollars up in New York City and Chicago, especially right now in February. Um, so we, you know, we look at those plans like, okay, how can we take advantage of that? Um, and we and we do. So we're we're lucky that we've got them as partners, and they can really help us um, get the word out about how nice it is not only to visit here but also to do business here. And that's what we've been starting to partner on those marketing initiatives more often now. Absolutely. Just we're going to oh. move right on. Okay. But save that thought, and we might come back to you. All right, Jamal. I want you to tie it all together for us. We're talking about businesses that want to come here. We have lots of jobs that need to be filled. How do we connect those people together? How has the workforce in Florida evolved to meet the demands of a changing economy? And what role does the education and skill development play in that? And how can we kind of bring those two pieces together? It's evolved a lot. Uh, I graduated high school in 2000. In 2000, the state was about 10 million. Now the state's about 21, 22 million. So drastically changed. And I was very adamant about leaving because as a Florida native, it was never cool to be from Florida because everybody was from somewhere else. I had friends I was born and raised with who may have moved to Florida at one years old, but they would still have a New York accent. I'm like, how do you have an accent? I was raised with you. But it was cool to be from New York. It wasn't cool to be from you know, Florida, but now that's totally changed. People who always repped New York and Boston or Chicago, they say, I don't want to live there. My wife is from Chicago. She has no desire to ever go back. And now the mindset has changed of people who may not be from here now who are claiming Florida. People who were born here now want to stay here. But what that does specifically for workforce, we want to keep those skills here. And also, if I could change things, while I went to college in Gainesville, I wish I would have gotten a trade. Being an electrician, a mechanic, and here's why. College was teaching me the intellectual repertoire of business, but having that skill, if you're a mechanic, now I can open up my own mechanic shop and hire people. That's economic development. I can uh, open up my own electrician shop and hire people because I have that skill set. You just need the basic skill set. So as you think about college, uh, you can also get that trade too. And now, because you know what to do, you hire people, you train them, you become a CEO, a business president. So I wish I would have thought uh, long term about why the trades are still important. As you seek this great education at St. Pete College, also think about getting that extra skill under your belt so now you can have your own company and really be independent as an owner because that is true economic freedom when you can create jobs and can employ people and that is really what the workforce needs are skill workers but also people who may know a little bit because they got the trade but now they're the bosses hiring people for those trades because during COVID we still needed plumbers we still needed HVAC they made a lot of money my friends who were in HVAC and AC they made a lot of money because people were now at home my people who were electricians having to instill broadband for the internet that you needed at home because you weren't going anywhere they made so much money I'm like, yeah, L let me go ahead and change my mindset about people now getting trades on top of education, which is great, but that is going to last forever, and that's really what the workforce needs at this moment. Absolutely. Thank you for wrapping that together. Um, I think we're out of time for some questions. Do you all? Okay, if you guys want to pass your cards over to the sides, and Aaron is there to collect them. Thank you so much. All, any and all questions from all the participants. We appreciate you guys. Oh, we got one more over here. Thank you so much. All right. And as you have those questions, go ahead and hand them to Aaron and Sam.
All right. And we appreciate everyone being here today and hearing from these different regional points of view, which, as we have heard, is so important on not just the job creation and the economic development, now that we know what all those things mean, but how are we going to get our current students and learners to those positions that are going to ultimately impact our economic development for the future. All right, Ms. Kim, are we set? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, I don't know where I'll get through all of these, but hopefully your question will be asked. And feel free to chat with our panelists afterwards as well if you didn't get your question answered. Okay. All right. City of Sarasota, I see here. How is the city of Sarasota going to balance the needs of existing older populations as well as the growing youth populations? Places like Pineapple Street downtown have very rowdy areas during late hours. How will Sarasota handle expanding areas like this while also appealing to the older generations? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, yeah, it really is interesting. Like I mentioned previously, a lot of, a lot of young people, a lot of older people um, I think the, the older people are still resistant. They're resistant to change. They're resistant to anything that a lot of times is cool. They're starting to transition. Um, and it, for example, um, uh, we, have, uh, we have a, our city's growing so fast that the cost of housing has gone through the roof. Um, we figured out two teachers with a couple of kids, let's say, uh, can't even afford a one-bedroom apartment in Sarasota, uh, much less a two-bedroom or something larger than that. So, um, and one of the things that um, we started promoting was a new affordable or attainable housing program in the city of Sarasota to address this issue, because it's a huge problem. And it has tremendous impacts on the, the economies of the cities. You know, you might have all this great stuff going on, but if everybody's commuting an hour away, um, you know, or they can't afford to live there, your workforce is going to drop off. So the, the, the older community living in the luxury condos, they really weren't interested in this. I actually had a couple come up to me and said, well, we'd, we'd like to keep downtown all market rate housing. Um, I said, well, what do you mean by that? She says, well, you know, the people that work downtown, they can, they can take the bus or drive 10 or 15 minutes to work. I said, well, we're not doing that, you know, and, and so uh, they didn't like that answer, but we were going so we, we initiated a, a whole affordable attainable housing program which for downtown it's already been approved actually for the rest of the city it's coming up for a vote Monday um, but what we've done is um, and what's interesting is over time the older population has kind of accepted this they realize that hey this really is something important that needs to be done and so um, uh, once we get this through, actually, uh, right now, um, we have about 636 units, population about 55,000. We have 636 units in the pipeline already, affordable units that are in the pipeline for development review right now. So, uh, and what we did was we provided uh, a really a significant a density incentive for developers to, to incorporate affordable housing in their, in their projects. And so, um, it's it's start we're starting to see you know it take off already which is really good uh but i i think you know with, it's so funny because the the older population oh we don't want to see that and then when it's built or when it's done or the special event is taking place they go hey that's that's kind of cool we like that and so they're gradually gradually shifting what we think is in the right direction Absolutely, and I think that's viable for all the communities that are represented here on, again, a regional level, and that's something that's very applicable to the young students that are in the audience today, thinking about housing affordability, housing attainability, how can I live by where I work, how can I work by where I live, and it's great to know that the entities that are represented here and across our region are really thinking about that at the state level, have been thinking about that with the Live Local Act and some of the different incentives that have been put forward to make sure that we can continue to have the right people in the right jobs and moving forward, so. Yeah, yeah just one, one real quick sure. thing. Uh, one thing we did communicate to the older population of our city is, and we did it in a tactful manner, but you know, a lot of the things that we're doing and, and, and proposing, it isn't about them, it's not for them. You know, it's for their kids and their kids' generation. It's really not, not about them. So, and they're starting to catch on 
to that. So Absolutely. And the only thing consistent in life is change, right? No one wants it changed from the exact way that it was when they got there, but things will always change and grow and expand. So that everyone to be open to that. So thank you. Um, this is a question for everyone. So if, it, if you think you want to answer this one, let me know. And I love this one from our students. How do we keep young uh, adults here in Pinellas County when it, it costs when it costs less to live in Pasco or other surrounding counties so to, a little bit of like the transportation and transit question coming in there and kind of the value in that regionality does anyone have anything to t think about that so right so I'm probably the right person to ask this question to because I live in Pasco and work for Pinellas um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, it's a great question, and we have similar um, issues as Sarasota. The, the housing affordability is top of mind for everyone right now. Um, we're also doing um, different bonuses and incentives um, with our developers for affordable housing, or, or what we call workforce housing as well. Um, now, one, you know, a quick drive through Pinellas, and you quickly see that there's not a whole lot of empty space, right? Not a lot of green space. So, you know, one of our challenges looking um, future forward, you know, many years is our housing stock. We can't build whole new neighborhoods like Pasco can, right? Pasco's got some beautiful new neighborhoods and that's where the workforce is coming from. I'm right on the edge of the Pinellas Pasco border and I can tell you every morning I sit at that light at East Lake and Trinity Boulevard and those cars <laughs> pouring out of Trinity Boulevard, all, that's the workforce coming from Pasco. Right, so it's something that we, we definitely need to consider because um, you know, 20, 30 years from now, our houses in Pinellas County are gonna be old. I mean, some of them already are, of course. <laughs> We've had some redevelopment, um, but a lot of those um, you know, neighborhoods that were booming and, and being built in 1990, you know, they're, they're aging. Um, and it's not gonna be an attractive place for, um, the, for the workers that are coming in. They want a nice new shiny house, right? Not, so um, we have to focus, you know, not only think about the affordable housing in terms of apartments and townhouses and condos, but just on the residential, um, you know, one family homes as well. Um, so there's some long-term challenges for sure. Um, and that's, like I said, it's top of mind right now, and we have several programs and some of the penny for Pinellas money, um, that, that one cent tax, sales tax, that money, a lot of that money is going now to affordable housing because we know that's where the need is. And I think a lot of people don't realize the correlation between affordable housing and transportation. There is a direct connection. Um, and so, you know, like, like with the city of Sarasota, we have a lot of people work downtown, but they're commuting 45 minutes to an hour. So it impacts the roads, it impacts everything. So, you know, if you do incorporate more affordable housing in your community, then they can hop on their bike and go to work. Uh, we, we just kicked off a trolley and a bike and scooter share program, which is really doing well, providing other transportation options besides the car. Um, we're looking at the water taxi right now and microtransit, so, um, you know, we're, you know we, we really will be able to serve the entire city. But unless you have those affordable housing units close to where everybody's working, you're going to have big transportation problems. I, I was planning director in the city of Atlanta, and uh, someone came up to me and said, well, the city of Atlanta's never done a transportation plan. And I said, I can tell, because <laughs> the traffic is brutal in the city of Atlanta. So uh, anyway, but there's, there's a direct correlation and I, I think that's something we have to address as well. Yeah. Mike. So real quick from a Pasco perspective, just because I was mentioning that question there. So Pasco historically has been the bedroom community of Tampa Bay. Um, that is changing very fast. Um, we are pretty much on the borderline not really being that much more affordable than our neighbors to the south. Um, that being said, there's a lot of work that we need to do as well. Um, one of the things that we're doing or the county is doing right now is engaging in a study to learn more about how to promote attainable housing. So we might have to talk. Um, but we have tremendous redevelopment opportunities on US-19. Our US-19 in Pasco is very different than the US-19 <laughs> down here in Pinellas. Um, and, and we have some work to do there. Um, Christy mentioned the Live Local Act. That could go on for hours, this conversation. <laughs> but I do recommend all of you getting read up on that because there is uh, a lot of things happening up in Tallahassee right now that could dictate some of the terms in affordable housing. Absolutely. Before I turn it back over to Kim, there was one other question um, about 
how to get involved in this industry, right? It's evolving constantly and not sure how to be uh, an effective way to get myself started. And I won't necessarily turn it over, but I will say ask questions, right? Ask all of the people that are in this room on this panel, would love to answer your questions, would love to answer an email, I'm not throwing them under the bus, but I would as, <laughs> I would as well. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Have a cup of coffee, uh, answer an email. And that's really the best way to learn is uh, from someone that's in the industry right now and how you can make those connections because connections will help you get to your um, goals for the future. So happy to help in any way we can. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Kim. Thank you all. Thank you all for being so silent during this space, but I think it's appropriate to give a round of applause at this time. <laughs> So I want to take the time to thank each of you all individually. I know that your time is important. We value it. We really believe that at the Institute it's important for students to come face to face with the giants in our community who can share their wisdom and also share some of the things they would have done differently. Thank you for saying that. So for um, Christy, Joe, Suzanne, Mike, and Jamal and Steven, thank you so much for your time. So the Institute has continued programs. One thing that you all can do to help us is tell us how to shape our social media. <laughs> That's very challenging for us as we try to engage younger minds into this space. You can find us all over the place. We are on Facebook, on Instagram. We do have our um, LinkedIn page, which is new. We also have our YouTube page. All of our programs are available. We are fully transparent. We have another program coming up. It's a documentary that we created to honor um, Congressman Young on the 10th anniversary of his passing. Um, it'll be held at USF, one of the many buildings that he blessed in the community, particularly for veterans who are um, interested in coming to that program. That is March 20th. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about the Institute, our team is here that does a phenomenal job. Aaron, Sam, Matthew, and Sharon's up front. Thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you to the deans who are here, who participated to support. And we do have a board member here I'd like to acknowledge. Thank you, Valerie, for always showing up. And with that, um, have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>